Welcome to the proteomics course. In today's lecture, we will talk about applications of cell free protein microarrays. In previous lecture, we discussed how different type of cell free expression system can be employed to generate protein microarrays. We discussed different type of approaches including protein in situ arrays, nucleic acid programmable protein arrays, multiple spotting techniques, halotag arrays as well as DNA array to protein arrays. So, in general protein microarray technology allows the identification and quantification of proteins in high throughput manner. The recent advances in the protein microarray technologies, they offer unique opportunities to find novel biomarkers as well as apply this platform for several applications. The combination of proteomic scale technologies, especially the protein microarrays have potential to apply for wide variety of biological applications. The application of cell free expression based protein microarrays have seen a rampant increase because of the ease of synthesizing the proteins by using cell free expression based system as compared to the cell based traditional way of purifying the protein and then printing on the array surface. So, in today's lecture we will uh, talk about an overview of protein microarray experiment. So, first of all I will give you a broad overview how any type of protein microarray platform can be used for different type of applications. I will then describe few applications very briefly by taking some case studies. This will just give you an idea that how these platforms are used for wide variety of applications including biomarker screening, immunological studies as well as protein protein interactions. Finally, we will touch upon the challenges of analyzing the micro data regardless of you are performing an experiment to identify the protein interactors or looking for new biomarkers. The micro uh, experimental setup they provide very high throughput platform and generate data for the thousands of features simultaneously. Therefore, analyzing such data becomes very challenging. So, these three points will be discussed today. So, let us first start with the an overview of protein microarray experiment. So, regardless of what application one wants to probe on the protein microarrays, there are certain steps a workflow which is involved which needs to be followed to perform such experiments. Now, protein microarrays whether you have a cell based or a cell free platform you need to perform certain steps, but if you are using the cell free based protein microarray setup then you have to perform certain additional steps. The additional steps include synthesis of proteins on the chip first of all and then all the steps regardless of it is cell based or cell free it remains the same. It means in general I will show you an overview of the various steps involved in performing a protein microarray based experiment. So, let me give you an overview of various steps involved in performing a protein microarray experiment. I will show you how human proteome chips can be used for screening the biomarkers by using human serum. Now, as I mentioned same overview same steps can be performed for various type of applications. So, these chips have to be stored uh, precisely at minus 80 degrees you do not want to lose the protein activity if it is a purified protein array. If you are doing cell free expression based protein microarrays then you do not have to worry you can store the chips even on the room temperature. So, 
So there's only one difference between the cell-free expression based protein microarrays and the cell based protein expression uh, microarrays. In the cell-free expression one, you have to add the in vitro transcription and translation machinery to synthesize the protein and then whole assay can be performed on the chip. In the protein microarray cell based system, the purified proteins are printed on the chip and those are stored at the minus 80 degrees. As you can see in the 3D animation, very carefully the slides were removed from the minus 80 freezer. And now one need to thaw those slides very gently so that avoid any diffusion type of effect. The typical laboratory setup where you do not require very fancy setup here because similar to the western blot all these steps can be performed. After removing the chips from the minus 80 freezer or synthesizing the proteins by using cell-free expression based system, first of all you would like to block the those areas which do not have the spot features. So to avoid uh, non-specific binding, first of all one need to add a blocking solution. Blocking can be performed by using milk, it can be performed by using BSA, super block as well as scientists prefer a cocktail of different uh, reagents which could be used for the blocking solution. Now typically a blocking can be performed at the room temperature for an hour on a rocking shaker or it can be performed at 4 degrees overnight in the cold condition. A small pipette box even can be used for this purpose where you can add the super block or the blocking solution and then immerse the slide. One need to ensure the proper shaking while performing the blocking experiment. You do not want the milk or the blocking reagents should be uh, dried or it can be immersed on the chip surface. So it has to be very uniform and gentle shaking. After blocking step is completed, remove the slide from the blocking solution and tap against a paper towel so that one can remove the excess milk. So as I mentioned, one need to ensure that there is continuous mixing of the slide because if it is left sitting on the uh, rocker without mixing then slide will dry and it will appear dark when you are scanning for the uh, different type of features. Now in a typical micro experiment uh, as I mentioned regardless of your application one need to perform certain set of steps which are quite generic and then depending upon the requirement one can make changes and optimize the conditions for those experiments. So typical experiment include 
a primary antibody where one can use anti-query proteins if you are looking for the protein-protein interaction or one can add the patient serum which we are going to show you in this one for the immune response detection. And then a marker lint secondary antibody which is usually the HRP conjugated anti-mouse IgG or Cy3, Cy5 conjugated anti-human IgG can be used for signal detection. So now once the blocking is completed, one can apply the primary antibody as I mentioned. It can be a primary antibody or it can be serum if you are looking for the immune response detection. Now one need to ensure the right dilution because most of the time the serum gives very high background on the chip surface. So appropriate dilutions can be optimized based on the requirements. Often these conditions are quite similar to the one uses for the western blots. Once you are ready with the appropriate dilution of the serum, then you can apply those on the chip surface and place the cover sip for an hour. Similarly, you can add the primary antibody and then uh, place the cover slip. As I mentioned, these uh, are generic steps which could be used for variety of applications. So once the primary antibody or the serum is placed on the chip surface, then one need to incubate for at least an hour. And again, there are different uh, scientists try different type of approaches. Few people prefer using overnight incubation condition at 4 degrees and some groups prefer using a uh, one hour at room temperature. A different school of thoughts here. One is that if you are allowing uh, serum for long time, it is possible that it is going to give enough time for um, identifying the right targets. On the other hand, if you are allowing it very long, for example overnight incubation, it is possible that background will become very high. So people try different type of conditions in the labs and then they apply serum or primary antibody and then adjust the times for the incubation accordingly. Once the primary antibody uh, incubation is done, then you need to do the washing with the PBS tweed. The washing steps are very important in a micro experiment. One need to do uh, at least three or more washing with PBS and PBS twin. Uh, just so that uh, you are removing all the bound antibodies on the non-specific uh, array surface. If your washing steps are not very meticulous in the micro experiment, at the end you will see very high background and you will see many non-specific binding which will interfere with the signal detection. After washing a step, apply the secondary antibody, for example, anti-human IgG. And again, appropriate dilutions can be selected depending upon uh, what dilution works best uh, in your experimental setup. After addition of a secondary antibody, 
the chip can be incubated for an hour, You need to place the cover slip to avoid any dust or any other particles on the chip surface. Well, there are different uh, investigators use different strategies for identifying the signals. For example, your secondary antibody could be conjugated with the HRP based systems. If that is the case, then one can use uh, even a tyramide signal amplification system. The TSA reagent is a tyramide molecule which is linked to a label. It could be Psi 3 or Psi 5, which is activated by the hot radish peroxidase and forms the free radicals. As the reaction continues, the label molecule continues to accumulate and therefore one can see the good signal by using this TSA based detection system. Now when you are in adding the secondary antibody one can also use uh, Psi 3 or Psi 5 conjugated antibodies and those could be directly detected. After secondary antibody, then one need to wash the arrays again. With PBS screen three times, similar to what we performed in the uh, last step. After washing a strip, it is important to remove uh, any liquid which is adhered on the chip surface. One can use a centrifuge to remove this liquid or one can use compressed air to the dry the slides. Now you have to ensure the right type of rotors while you are uh, centrifuging the chips by using centrifuge. Now once the drying process is completed, the chips can be scanned by using scanners and selecting the appropriate wavelength. This just gives you an overview of different steps involved in a protein micro experiment. Addition of a primary antibody, addition of a protein for testing the interactions or addition of serum for looking the immune response. Different type of samples can be applied then washing steps are required. After that, appropriate secondary antibodies can be used and suitable detection strategies are applied for signal detection. After appropriate washing steps and drying, slides can be scanned and then this data can be further analyzed. After watching this video and uh, discussing about various steps which are involved in 
any protein microarray based experiment. Let us now look some applications of cell free based protein microarrays. Let us first discuss the biomarker identification. Biomarker discovery for the disease detection and pre screening has been one of the major thirst for the proteomics field. Biomarkers have potential to allow early disease detection as well as accurate diagnosis of the grade of the disease. These molecular signatures can also be used for the follow up of disease response, survival of patients as well as various other parameters. As you know there is need for early detection and therapy of diseases such as cancer. However, the discovery of a specific and sensitive molecular markers that remains challenging. So, people employ different type of technologies including protein microarray based systems to identify biomarkers which can be used for early disease detection as well as accurate diagnosis and different other applications. So, protein microarrays have greatly enhanced the biomarker discovery process because they allow a high throughput platform for simultaneous and rapid screening of thousands of protein. Many times the clinical samples are a limiting factor because you do not have a large amount of clinical sample to perform a study. In that regard also the protein microarray is very impressive because with few microliter sample one can screen all the thousands of protein features simultaneously on the same platform. So, biomarkers have potential for early identification of disease state, monitoring a disease treatment response as well as follow up on the disease prognosis. So, let us look at how cell free expression based protein microarrays have been employed for screening for the biomarkers. So, I am giving you the case study 1 detection of P53 autoantibodies using nucleic acid programmable protein arrays. The study is performed by Anderson and so on. So, antibodies to several tumor antigens are identified in the breast cancer patient sera. However, there is very little knowledge about the specificity and the clinical significance of antibody immune repertoire in the breast cancer patients. So, Anderson et al adapted a specific detection of autoantibodies in breast cancer patients by using nucleic acid programmable protein arrays. The slide gives an overview of detection of P53 autoantibodies using Napa microarray approach. So, let us discuss the details of the study in this animation. Biomarker identification in this animation we will discuss about detection of P53 autoantibodies in human serum using cell free expression based Napa microarrays study by Anderson et al 2008. In this study author generated protein microarrays based on Napa expression. As you can see in the Napa chemistry cDNA, BS3, BSA and capture antibody these four features are printed on the chip surface as a master mix. After addition of the cell free lysate proteins are expressed which can be then further probed with the diluted sera of breast cancer patients which contain P53 autoantibodies. In this study detection was carried out by means of HRP linked anti human IgG. The study detected P53 
auto antibodies by means of Napa microarrays, which was further confirmed by ELISA approach. As you can see, the spots are visible in the P53 positive sera, which are absent in the P53 negative sera. The P53 levels were found to be directly related to tumoral burden with serum antibody concentrations decreasing after new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, let us talk about case study 2 for the biomarker screening. A bead based assay for multiplexed detection of antibodies to EBNA1 and P53, a study performed by Wong et al. So, Wong et al used a Luminex suspension bead array platform for the rapid detection of antibodies in sera. A programmable multiplexed immunoassay was used for the rapid monitoring of humoral immunity. As this slide shows the overview of the steps performed in this experiment, the author demonstrated that the method can be used for rapid conversion of open reading frame over a few ohm derived cDNAs to multiplex bead ELISA for detection of antibody immunity in infectious diseases as well as for the tumor antigen identification. So, let us see the steps involved in this experiment by using this animation. We will now look at other application rapid bead based assay for multiplexed detection of antibodies to EBNA1 and P53 study by Wong et al. 2009. In this study, authors developed a programmable multiplexed immunoassay where tagged antigens were expressed by using in vitro transcription and translation. and capture these onto the anti tag coated beads. One self expression step was completed. The synthesized proteins were further immobilized onto the beads through the capturing agents. These beads were then mixed together. After mixing the beads together, the serum was added to these coupled beads and human IgG were detected by probing with the enzyme blinked anti human IgG. The colored reaction was observed on addition of substrate to the enzyme. The authors demonstrated that this approach for detection of antibodies to Epstein Barr virus nuclear antigen 1 or EBNA 1 and P53. Let us now move on to uh, other application immunological studies. So, on one hand, there are several 
uh, studies have shown application of protein microarrays including cell free based protein microarrays for biomarker screening. There are several studies have also focused on the immunological studies. This is case study 3 detection of potential immunogenic proteins of plasmodium falciparum a study performed by Dulan et al. So, Dulan et al used E. coli based cell free in vitro transcription and translation based system to produce 250 plasmodium falciparum proteins generated by the polymerase chain reaction and recombinational cloning approaches. After synthesizing the protein from these 250 uh, ORFs, authors profile antibodies that develop after natural or experimental infection or after the vaccination with the attenuated organism. Sera from malaria patients which have been exposed to the plasmodium falciparum either naturally or experimentally were is screened by using protein microarrays. In this study, authors identify 72 highly reactive plasmodium falciparum antigens. The proteins expressed specifically in the pre erythrocytic stage of plasmodium which was CSP as well as some liver stage specific antigens such as LSA1 were identified successfully by applying cell free expression based protein microarrays in this study. So, let us discuss this uh, experiment and the study by looking at this animation. Let us now discuss the immunological studies in this animation. The use of cell free expression based protein microarrays for detection of potential immunogenic proteins of plasmodium falciparum was studied by Dulan et al. 2008. In this study, authors carried out cell free expression of PCR amplified vectors using an Escherichia coli in vitro transcription and translation system. They expressed 250 putative proteins that were printed directly onto the microscopic array slides without any need for protein purification. These arrays were probed with serum samples from patients who had been naturally exposed to plasmodium falciparum and who were experimentally exposed by means of radiation attenuated plasmodium falciparum. Authors successfully identified 72 highly immunoreactive protein antigens as well as 56 previously uncharacterized antigens that were zero dominant. The study has shown some of the newly identified targets can serve as potential vaccine targets. Let us now talk about case study 4 identification of immunogens of Q fever caused by Coxelia burnetti, a study performed by Bayer et al. So, Q fever is widespread genosis disease caused by the Coxelia species. So, identification of immunogens of Q fever causing this disease were identified by using protein microarray based approach. So, in this study, authors used Coxella Burnetti protein microarrays to identify immunodominant antigens. Almost 2000 open reading frames were generated by using the cell free expression based approach E. coli uh, IVTT system and then employed this protein microarray platform for identifying the immunodominant antigens. So, some of the steps involved in this experiment uh, will be discussed in the following animation. 
Case study 4 Identification of immunogens of Q fever caused by Coxiella burnetii. Study by Bear et al. 2008. Bear et al. carried out in vitro transcription and translation of 1988 open reading frame of C. burnetii by using E. coli based cell free systems. 75 percent of the open reading frames were successfully generated as full length proteins by using cell free expression system and then spotted onto the nitrocellulose arrays. The cell free expression based microarrays were probed with sera from the patients who had been vaccinated as well as acute Q fever patients. Fifty proteins were identified that were found to react strongly with the immune serum. So, as you have got a glimpse of uh, different type of applications of protein microarrays such as uh, biomarker discovery and immunological studies. Now, let us look at another widely used application protein protein interactions by using self free expression based protein microarrays. So, in this part uh, of the lecture, I will mainly focus on the nucleic acid programmable protein arrays, how they have been employed to study the protein protein interactions. In this slide, I am showing you a small test array which we used to teach a course in the Cold Spring Harbor in New York, where students were making these arrays themselves. As you can see, array layout, there are only handful 5 genes printed in the duplicate on the chip along with vector control, master mix and the water. Now, if we want to study the June and FOSS protein interaction and if we use the FOSS as a query protein, the FOSS query protein will bind with the June spot and therefore, two spots are lighting up as you can see in the slide. So, in all the six blocks, there are duplicate of June proteins which are interacting with the FOSS protein. So, June FOSS interaction can be studied by using this system. Now, previous array was a small test array, but this slide shows you a high density array. Again, we want to test the protein protein interaction of June FOSS protein pairs. The students in this study used the FOSS as a query protein and then they identified June printed 4 times on the chip as the target. So, June FOSS again was used for the model system to demonstrate how protein protein interactions can be studied by using self free expression based NAPA microarrays. So, let us look at some case studies which have used the protein microarrays for using for studying the protein interactions. So, case study 5 identification of novel protein protein interaction using nucleic acid programmable protein microarrays a study by Ramachandran et al. 2004. So, Ramachandran et al. reported generation of self assembling uh, microarrays which was one of the novel technology reported in science in 2004 and this study authors used a pairwise interaction among 29 human DNA replication initiation proteins which recapitulated the regulation of CDT1 binding to the selected replication proteins and mapped its germinin binding domain by using nucleic acid programmable protein microarray approach. So, let me describe you some of the steps involved in this experiment by showing you this animation. Protein interaction studies Case study 5 Identification of novel protein protein interactions using nucleic acid programmable protein microarrays. Study by Ramachandran et al. 2004. Ramachandran et al. tested 
the use of NAPA microarrays by immobilizing 29 sequence verified human genes involved in the replication initiation on the array surface. and then expressing them in replicate with rapid reticulocyte lysate. The expressed proteins bound to the anti-GST antibodies which are the capture antibodies present on the array surface. Authors made use of each of these express proteins to probe another duplicate array of the same 29 proteins, thereby generating a 29 by 29 protein interaction matrix. 110 interactions were detected between proteins of the replication initiation complex, of which 63 were previously undetected. Now, let us discuss the case study 6, high density NAPA array approach for studying well characterized gene pairs, study by Ramachandran et al. 2008. The previous study was more proof of a concept where handful proteins were taken for uh, studying the interactions, whereas this time a high density array was used where thousands of features were printed. So, Ramachandran et al used a high density NAPA approach to study the binary interactions between several well characterized interacting pairs such as June FOS, P53 and MDM2. Now, selective binding to these interactions were identified by using specific antibodies. So, in the protein interaction one thing which becomes very tedious to test out protein interaction in both directions. For example, if one is testing the June and FOS interaction it should work in either way. For example, if FOS is printed on the array June should be able to bind if it is used as a query protein or similarly if June is printed on the array then FOS protein can be used as a query for showing the interaction. Many times these interactions become unidirectional, it becomes very tedious to show that interaction is working in either direction. But in this study authors showed that the protein interaction of June FOS can be shown in both the direction. Now, in addition to showing that uh, protein expression and protein interaction works, one thing which is interesting from this study that a co-expression can be performed. For example, there is not even need to purify the protein which is used as a query protein. So, if you have a protein microarrays, uh, features are printed on the chip and then you have generated the contents by using self free expression based system. Now, you want to study the interaction. For that, you have to purify a protein and you use that as an interactor. Now, you can use either protein specific antibody to identify the interaction or you can use the tag a specific antibody for detecting the interaction. But in this study, authors used co-expression. It means the query proteins along with the arrayed proteins were expressed by using self-free expression system. So, there was no need to in fact purify the query protein as well. When the protein interaction study has to be performed, you take the cDNA of FOS for example, mix it in the rabbit reticulocyte lysate along with the other in vitro transcription translation machinery. Mix the whole cell lysate on the chip surface and then after incubation when proteins are expressed at the same time the query cDNA will also express the protein and then if it finds its binding partner it is going to bind to those features which can be detected by using protein specific or tag specific antibodies. So, by performing this type of approach authors allowed co-expression, it means same environment for both query and the target proteins. Now, both proteins are expressed in the same mammalian environment and there is good, good likelihood that they are going to identify the right interactors. 
So, let me show you the steps involved in the study by showing you this animation. High density NAPA approach for studying well characterized gene pairs, study by Ramachandran et al. 2008. In this study, authors made use of high density nucleic acid programmable protein arrays to study protein protein interactions. 647 unique genes were printed onto the array surface and expressed by adding the cell free expression based system. After addition of cell free expression based system, proteins containing GST tag were synthesized and bound onto the capture antibody. cDNA of the query protein was also added to the same mixture such that the query was co-expressed, but remained unbound due to the lack of a tag capturing agent. These protein microarrays were then probed with antibodies specific to the query proteins. Authors detected various protein interactions using well known query proteins such as June, FOS and MDM2. So, now we have uh, seen the overview of how protein microarray experiments can be performed. We have looked at various applications by employing cell free expression based protein microarrays. We have discussed biomarker screening, immunological studies and protein protein interactions. Now, regardless of what application you want to perform on these arrays, you are going to generate large amount of data. So, the volume of data generated from the micro experiment are prodigious. It becomes important to develop the appropriate informatic system, so that one can analyze this data uniformly and make some very good uh, output from this whole analysis. Uh, what are the major challenges of the microarray data analysis? Uh, also, I'd like to get your comments mm -hmm. that uh, what should be the good statistical design mm -hmm. when biologists are starting some experiment for mm -hmm. the microarray? Because most of the time these are clinical samples and they would like to uh, get some very useful biological information from mm -hmm. this. Statistical is a very important aspect of uh, uh, this biological experiments and I think uh, the statistician get involved from the beginning of the experiments and the, the importance of statistician is uh, as you mentioned about the sample not only just sample size but to also to understand the experiment right. and uh, control the variation in any biological experiment and so it's a very good idea to have a statistician from the beginning of uh, the experiment and where they can uh, contribute uh, not only on the data analysis point of, but also to conducting and performing a optimal design experiment way, so you can have a uh, as precise and as useful information out of the data or the experiment you are trying to achieve. That's very important, uh, but uh, there are many ways of analyzing micro data, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the uh, different approaches which are available, mm -hmm. and which one would you consider as a good approach? Yes. There are, uh, I say, uh, statistical is it, uh, methods are uh, tools and it depends on your objective. So, when, whenever you are trying to perform experiment, I think uh, one has to be very clear with the objectives and which uh, when you talk to the st uh, statistician, they will let you know what uh, methods are appropriate, your experiment to your uh, hypothesis and in that case, uh, uh, statistician will let you know uh, how you should go and perform the experiment and not only experiment but also to control the biological or technical errors which are involved in when you are performing experiment. So, but the methods as I said there are these uh, uh, new methods are uh, evolving each and every day in this field and it's because uh, uh, 
biological problems are very complex. Uh, it's not like you can answer <laughs> by telling one method. So, right. uh, but uh, of course there are some standard methods being used in other fields, and people are trying to use those soon, uh, like the same methods in the in a biological point of view. Uh, or I would like to say. The, all the methodologies developed in uh, statistics being based on the small sample size. And now in the, the recent uh, years, so I would say uh, nowadays we are dealing with a huge data set and particularly in biological field. So in that case, uh, we have to come up with uh, new methods or new methodology uh, in statistics which can handle more appropriately and more uh, objective oriented uh, um, uh, statistic, uh, statistical uh, method. So, uh, I am convinced that uh, it's not possible to really uh, list out one best method. Yes. But at least I'll can you provide a uh, few possible solutions? Absolutely. I will totally agree with you on that. And there is no unique method. And is not only in biological point of, but even in general as well. Because statistics should be, statistical is always dependent, model dependent, uh, or the experiment dependent uh, techniques. So it only develops uh, type of data or the experiment objective you're trying to achieve. Uh, Sudesh, uh, in the micro field, biologists apply that to uh, identify differential expression of genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what type of issues you see like in terms of analyzing these data set from mm -hmm. the micro arrays? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are different ways of analyzing that data and uh, any comments on that? I would like to say the statistical method used uh, in identifying differential expression gene analysis it starts from experimental design uh, till the end of the analysis for the uh, till the final conclusion of the analysis so there are a number of uh, methods available and particularly at design stage because uh, it's a design stage there is a different kind of design like uh, you must have heard about the loop design reference designs and uh, also the factorial design is depending on your situation you try to uh, perform your experiment. And all these uh, uh, experimental design uh, are basically depend on the statistical tool you want to use for your data analysis. And like uh, when you are using uh, reference design or you're using loop design, so basically you're trying to compare the two treatments or the like the control or sorry, yes, uh, or the tumor. So in that case, uh, you use T-test, like when you are comparing just two conditions. And in case if you are dealing more more than two conditions, then you go a little bit analysis of variance kind of analysis. And then you uh, use bootstrap method, you use SAMS method, and uh, also there's a, another method called Welsh method. So these are the all methods appropriate in, in your uh, situation when you are dealing with identifying differential expression genes. So there are a lot of uh, options available, but mm -hmm. it always becomes challenging to apply which one is uh, a real good one. Oh, yeah, for, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And that's why we need uh, some good uh, statistical uh, people I'm, in the team for analysis. I'm glad to hear that word because uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, most of the times what happen, uh, the, the scientists or basic scientist research, they, they go to the statistician when they're done with their experiment and they go to and they take their data to the statistician and they ask them, oh, could you please analyze the data? And so in that case, uh, I would like to say there's a very famous saying from R.A. Fisher, uh, when you go to the statistician with your data, so only the statistician can do a post-mortem of your data <laughs> and can tell you how the data dies. Very and said. So yeah. I, with that uh, remark, I would like to say, if you're trying to conduct uh, any uh, research uh, hypothesis or trying to perform any research-oriented biological question so I would say go to the statistician from the beginning and they can help you to at least uh, get the optimal way of uh, experiments itself so that the, that way you can do the best analysis or best mathematics tools uh, to appropriate your situation so uh, I would say yes yeah, statistician should be or must be involved from the beginning of the, uh, the experiment. So I must say that this is a take home um, from this interview that mm -hmm. uh, it's not at the end, but actually from the beginning, mm -hmm. when we need to involve uh, a statistician for the large set of analysis if we want to perform some different uh, uh, high throughput experiments. Mm -hmm. And especially in the genomics and proteomics, it's very important because we invest a lot of technology in a lot of samples. And if our experimental design is not very well, mm -hmm. then later on everything will fail.
So with that thought, I will conclude this interview and I would like to thank Dr. Sudesh for being with us and sharing some of his experience on uh, micro data analysis and challenges. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. So in the image analysis, when you are talking about high density approaches, the data analysis, image analysis becomes very challenging. For example, you can see an image here for the protein microarrays and as shown in this spot, the expression of this particular uh, uh, immunogenic protein is so high that it is spilling over to the neighboring proteins. Now, one need to correct for this or remove those spots which are in the peripheral of this protein. So, scaling up is good approach because one wants to perform high throughput experiment so that thousands of features can be studied simultaneously. However, while scaling up especially when you are using the self-free expression based approaches, uh, one need to be cautious that what should be the optimum density for these arrays. Because if there is a spillover of express protein on the neighboring spot, that is going to affect the uh, values for the neighboring spot. Again, this slide shows how protein is diffused in the neighboring spot, which should be neighboring spot should be removed. Similarly, the background correction and various other parameters one need to analyze to perform a good microarray data analysis. So, let us have a discussion with Dr. Sudesh Srivastava on microarray data analysis, what are the challenges involved and then subsequent lectures we will talk in more detail about different steps and integrities of those which one need to follow up for data analysis of microarray based systems. So, in summary, the protein microarrays offer novel technology for the simultaneous and rapid analysis of multiple biomarkers or interactors in high throughput manner. Microarrays have been widely used for detection of antigens as well as antibodies in blood sample and various other clinical samples. However, the traditional cell based approaches have certain limitations. Therefore, the cell free expression based protein microarrays have emerged and very strongly it has been shown that various applications can be performed without need to purify the proteins because you can generate the protein content in the cell free manner. In today's lecture, I gave you an overview of steps involved in performing a protein microarray experiment whether you want to do the protein interaction or any type of disease screening, one has to go through all those steps. Then we looked at different type of applications in different case studies. Obviously, the case study discussion was very brief, but you can refer to those references and read those papers for further details. Finally, we got a discussion with uh, a leading expert Dr. Sudesh Srivastava on the microarray data analysis and we will continue our discussion on applications as well as microarray data analysis challenges in the subsequent lectures. Thank you.